Welcome, Eco Advocates. Hello, Girl Scouts. Let's celebrate Sea Turtle Week by learning how we can protect the species. The National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, works to protect and conserve six of the seven sea turtle species that are found in the U.S. waters. The other one is international waters. All are threatened and endangered. These six species face many threats in our oceans today and are a key part of the ecosystem. We are going to learn about the largest sea turtle today. Okay, thank you for joining us virtually on our second Sea Turtle Week virtual event with NOAA. Today is a great day to learn about sea turtles that are at risk to participate and participate in local conservation efforts. We will learn what we can do to make a difference in our own backyard. And it's a day to recognize and support national efforts to protect endangered species and their habitats. Let's take action like Girl Scouts. We can turn this patch program into a higher award. Hello everyone. My name is Carrie Horton and with me on this webinar is our guest speakers from NOAA, Robin LaRue and Erin Casella. Um, we are excited to have two research scientists here today to share how they protect leatherback sea turtles. Let's get started. As you girls know, we are going to start with our Girl Scout promise and law. Um, follow with me. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country to help people at all times and to live by the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, responsible for what I do and say to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place and be a sister to every Girl Scouts. We have a few housekeeping requests we wanna cover with you before we get started. First, only our guest speakers and I will have our microphones and cameras on today. If you have questions, please type them in the question box at the bottom of your window. Please only use the question box for on top of questions during the webinar as we want to answer all your questions. There will be time at the end of the webinar to ask additional questions. And as we all are virtual, everyone's bandwidth is a little different. There will be some short videos to watch. If for some reason you can't see them, um, we will place the URL in the information handout so you can watch them after the webinar or if you want to watch them again. Let's, okay. Let's bring out the GIRL in Girl Scouts and look at completing this patch program virtually and safely. We'll be completing half of the step two and step four of the endangered species patch program. And cadets will complete step three in the cadet STEM career badge. I hope you've already downloaded the endangered species patch booklet. If not, it is being added to the chat and it is on our Girl Scout website under kits and patches. It'll be on the final slide. And of course it's on our, our website. So go ahead and check that out. Um, when you've earned this patch, you will have dived deep into learning about leatherback sea turtles and how the ESA protects them. With this webinar today, we are inspiring you to complete this patch. This patch program can't be completed in an hour on a webinar. So we hope to help you start on your passion for protecting the environment. Um, to under so NOAA's mission statement is to understand, predict changes in climate, weather, ocean, oceans, and our coast to share that knowledge and information with others, to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and their resources. So NOAA, which we'll continue to refer to, is the no National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Hmm. Um, today is our fifth webinar, 
partnering with NOAA over the past year. I know from their mission statement that they enjoy sharing their knowledge and information with everyone. Protecting the ocean and the species that inhabit is a passion. I wanted to take a moment and thank everyone at NOAA who has shared their knowledge with Girl Scouts and participated in these awesome webinars. These, are, these have been amazing webinars with extraordinary researchers. Let me start by introducing our two leaders. Welcome, Robin. Robin LaRue. Um, Robin LaRue is the Deputy Director of the Marine Mammal and Sea Turtle Division, MMTD. She has over 20 years of experience as a marine turtle biologist with the Southwest Fishery Science Center. Her research has focused on using genetics to improve our understanding of marine turtle nesting and foraging population structures. Fisheries bycatch monitoring of foraging green sea turtles in Southern California, as well as serving on the Southwest Fishery Science Center Sea Turtle Stranding Coordinator for over 10 years. She currently serves as the Division Deputy Director and leads the MMTD Science Implementation Planning and Policy Program, which conducts operations and management for the Division Five Scientific Research Program. Her primary focus is on short and long-term strategy plannings to meet scientific and management objectives, as well as budgeting, planning, management, and execution. Welcome, Robin. We are so excited that you're here um, to talk to and how you protect these wonderful species. We're gonna go to Aaron. Erin joined the Marine Turtle Genetics Program in 2000, following earning her Bachelor's of Science degree in Ecology from UC San Diego. Erin's primary focus is using molecular genetics to define population structures, stock origin of fishery bycatch, and add to baseline for nesting populations to assist in the management and conservation of marine turtle populations. In the field, Erin assists with green sea turtle research in Cal Southern California, leatherback nesting beach monitoring in St. Croix and U.S. Virgin Islands, and is the lead aerial survey coordinator for our Central California leatherback research projects. These are two amazing women that we have here today. Oh, whoops, Erin. Just a little more tidbit, Erin manages the import export of sea turtle samplings under the CITES Act and is the lead coordinator for Southwest Fishery Science Center sea turtle strandings in San Diego County. Okay, again, we have an amazing panel of women today. I'm gonna put up our first poll um, because we love to know why you're attending these webinars and I thought it would be interesting to see. So ladies, if you can take 30 seconds and we will, um, we will capture this poll. And I hope everyone's doing well on this beautiful day. I don't know what it's doing in California, but it is a lovely day in um, the DMV area. All right, it's been 30 seconds. Ladies, thank you very much for I will share the results. So um, it seems like the majority of 80% of our people are very excited about today's virtual program. All right. Okay. Cadets, seniors, and ambassadors, do you want to protect wildlife, our environment, and make the world a better place? Eco advocates. As Girl Scouts, environmental stewardship has been a key part of Girl Scouts' experience for over a century. What did we stay at the start of our meeting? The Girl Scout promise and law, use resources wisely and to make the world a better place. All right, so one of the reasons why you girls are here I know is to complete the awesome endangered species patch. So there are five steps to complete the patch. 
We are going to complete some of the activities today. There are more details in the handout provided later. We'll also be completing half of step two, which we will be investigating the leatherback sea turtle. And we will complete step four. We have two awesome NOAA scientists with us to share their experience. And cadets will also complete step three in the cadet STEM career badge. So we want to explore, investigate, create, experience. And of course, as all Girl Scouts do, we take action. So we want to present what we've learned. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first step in the Endangered Species Patch Program is exploring the Endangered Species Act. You need to complete step one after the webinar, but here's some information for us to get started. Um, we are going to start off and expand our vocabulary. Understanding the terms used in connection with the process of protecting the endangered species is important. Threatened, endangered, and then extinct. Threatened means a species is likely to become endangered with the foreseeable future. Endangered means a species is endangered of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. And extinction, there is no known living individuals. Extinction is forever. That is why the Endangered Species Act is so important. The Endangered Species Act provides common sense balanced solutions for government agencies, landowners, landowners, and concerned citizens to conserve endangered wildlife and their habitats. So what is extinction? The answer is really complicated from locally extinct, functionally extinct, extinct in the wild to extinct, gone forever. Sometimes species are endangered even as they're discovered. Worldwide, they estimate that a dozen new species go extinct every day. Over the past four plus decades, the Endangered Species Act has repeatedly demonstrated that when used to the full extent of the law, it works. The act has been more than 99% successful at preventing extinction. Were it not for the act, scientists have estimated at least 227 species would have likely gone extinct since the law's passage in 1973. Okay, so how does the Endangered Species Act protect endangered species? Well, the act includes three key elements, preventing listed species from being killed or harmed, protecting habitat essential to those species survival and creating a plan to recover these species, including plants and animals. So to the, to the interesting stuff, endangered species. Okay, so listing a species is essential. Now, only after a species is listed, does a species receive the critical benefit of the act's protection. So why don't we welcome both Aaron and Robin from the NOAA lab as we are excited to hear about leatherback sea turtles. Oops. All right, ladies. Hi everyone, I'm Robin. First off, I'd like to thank you all for hosting us and being here today. And then give a special thanks to Carrie, Katie and Rachel for their efforts to organize this workshop. Erin and I are really excited to be here to help you earn your endangered species patch. For those of you that don't know, this is Sea Turtle Week. And similar to Shark Week, it's a chance for individuals around the world to come together to celebrate and learn about sea turtles. Oh, you, you already switched the slides, so, okay, hold on, you got me a little. Uh, there are seven species of sea turtles alive today, which include the leatherback, the Olive Ridley, Kemp's Ridley, Green, Loggerhead, Hawksbill, and Flatback. There are some obvious differences that you can see between the species, which include their size, as well as their shell coloration, their shape, and their skew patterns. They also differ in what they eat. For instance, some species prefer eelgrass, where others like crustaceans, like small crabs, or even jellyfish. 
They're, they also differ in where, they're, where they forage, either in coastal or offshore environments, and the types of habitats that they prefer to nest in. Some like to nest on sandy beaches where others prefer areas with more vegetation like mangroves. Carrie gave a great overview of the Endangered Species Act. And for the six species of sea turtles that inhabit U.S. waters, the leatherback, hawksbill, and Kemp's ridley are listed as endangered, and the green loggerhead and olive ridley are listed as threatened or endangered depending on their population. For instance, green turtles that live in the Pacific Ocean are considered a different population than green turtles in the Atlantic Ocean, and they are managed as separate populations. Under the Endangered Species Act guidelines, it's NOAA's responsibility to work towards recovering marine turtle populations by assessing their conservation uh, status as well as their threats. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> that, was, that was the slide of what I just talked about. So next slide, please. Sorry about that. Sea turtle evolution is ancient. The oldest relatives of sea turtles were on Earth over 150 million years ago. The skeleton photo represents an ancient sea turtle known as the Archelon. An Archelon reached lengths of up to 12 feet. <clears throat> Both current surviving families were common during the Cretaceous period, which was about 100 million years ago. In contrast, the dinosaur extinction occurred 65 million years ago, where over 70% of all species on Earth went extinct. Amazingly, and lucky for us, sea turtles were one of the few animals that survived. Today, Erin and I are going to focus our presentation on the leatherback turtle with an emphasis on leatherback populations in the Pacific Ocean. While there are seven species of sea turtles, the leatherback is the only living turtle in the family Dermachilidae. The leatherback's common name comes from its unique carapace, which is um, also known as its shell, and it's composed of a thin, tough uh, layer of rubber, rubbery skin that's strengthened by thousands of uh, tiny bone, bony plates that make it look leathery. And interestingly, of all the sea turtles, the leatherback is the oldest living sea turtle um, that dates back over 100 million years. Some unique features, next slide. I keep getting messed up, I'm so sorry. That's okay. So this is the slide that talks about um, where they are taxonomically. And what I just mentioned was that the leatherback is the only species that is in the family Dermachilidae. Okay, next slide, please. Some unique features of leatherbacks include that they are the largest living sea turtle and can measure up to six feet in length and weigh up to 2000 pounds. So if you think back to the picture I showed of the skeleton, the Archelon um, was basically twice the size of a leatherback at 12 feet. They have the fastest growth rate of all the seven. Oh, you need to go back, Carrie. Please, thank you. Okay. Uh, they have the fastest growth rate of all the seven species and inhabit tropical to temperate waters. In the Pacific, they can be found as far north as Alaska to the southern tip of New Zealand. And unlike the hard-shelled turtles, their body, larger body size and thick layer of blubber allows them to maintain warm body temperatures in cold water. <clears throat> so for the um, hard-shelled turtles, they mainly stay in tropical to, to uh, slightly temperate waters, whereas leatherbacks have that wider range. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Erin, and she's going to give you some more information about the research we do on leatherbacks. Next slide. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. And I echo uh, Robin in saying thank you for having us here today. Um, so as you can imagine, sea turtles face many threats on land and in the sea. And unfortunately, most of the major factors are caused by humans. 
Uh, pollution and trash end up in the oceans and get ingested by turtles and other marine life. Unintentionally caught in fishing gear, which is also known as fisheries bycatch, and illegal harvest of turtles and their eggs has also had a major negative impact on populations worldwide. Now, habitat loss causes the disappearance of nesting beaches, whether it's due to natural erosion or building houses. And climate change is an important topic. Uh, turtles have what is called temperature dependent sex determination, which means the temperature of the sand during the incubation period of a nest determines whether the hatchlings will be male or female. So needless to say, there are many, many threats that they face. Uh, next slide. Now, female turtles must come ashore uh, to lay their eggs in the sand, and therefore all sea turtles begin their lives as tiny hatchlings on land. Now, for decades, much of the turtle research conducted around the world has focused on, on nesting females and hatchlings, mainly because they're the easiest to study. It's much more difficult to study uh, turtles in the open ocean. Now, historically, we know that there are three main nesting stocks in the Pacific that make up the key nesting beaches for Pacific leatherbacks, as you can see on this map. The Eastern Pacific stock, seen in red, consists of nesting beaches from Mexico and Costa Rica. The Western Pacific stock in green is made up of nesting beaches from Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. The Malaysia population is functionally extinct due to decades of near 100% removal of eggs, hence there were no adults to come back to nest. Now in the US waters, um, in the Pacific Ocean, we have no nesting, however, we do have turtles that come here to feed or forage. Uh, next slide. So a study conducted by our colleague Scott Benson in 2015 shows the nesting trends for the Pacific leatherback. The colored bars and dots represent the populations I just mentioned. There you go. <laughs> um, and the main point here is that the graph shows a dramatic decline in nesting throughout the Pacific just in the past few decades. Now since the 1980s, the declines have occurred due to lots of threats, but mainly because of the harvesting of adults egg poaching and fishery bycatch. Uh, next slide. Now at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, we have two turtle programs, uh, the Marine Turtle Ecology and Assessment Program and the Marine Turtle Genetics Program. And we work together to generate and communicate the science that supports the management needs within our region for NOAA. Now, remember what Robin had mentioned that under the Endangered Species Act, one of our mandates is to determine the abundance and the distribution of turtles in the marine environment. Next slide. So we developed a very important research project 20 plus years ago located in Central California between Monterey Bay and San Francisco, San Francisco, as you can see on the map. Uh, we knew from decades of aerial surveys stranding records and fishery bycatch data that Pacific leatherbacks are present in the waters off of Central California, Oregon, and Washington. Now, many of the research questions that came about are what nesting populations are these turtles from? What are their migratory patterns? How many turtles are here in our local waters or what we call abundance? What are their major threats? What do they eat? Are they healthy? And so on. Next slide. So to get at some of our questions, some of these questions, some of the research tools we use are aerial surveys, where we fly in a small plane with a team of observers to methodically look for turtles. The data that we collect from these surveys help us gain a better understanding of how many leatherbacks there are, or their abundance, and their distribution off the coast of California. Now these surveys have also been key in the success of our in-water capture efforts where we use a boat with a team of scientists and specialized equipment for pulling the turtles safely on deck. Now, once brought safely on board, the animals are sampled, measured, weighed, and tagged. Satellite telemetry is a tool that allows us to track the movement of an animal by attaching a transmitter to its shell or carapace. And when it surfaces for air, the transmitter sends out a signal that is detected by orbiting satellites. 
Uh, this powerful technology has provided valuable information on these migratory routes, their dive behavior, as well as where their major threats are. Now, the leatherback is also known to be the deepest diving reptile, which can go about 1,230 meters or three quarters of a mile deep, thanks to tools such as these special telemetry techniques. Um, turtle born video has also provided some amazing data, which I'll discuss a little bit more in a minute. Um, but a colleague of ours designed a video camera attached, ugh, excuse me, attached to a suction cup that we can stick to the carapace of the turtle. It's pretty awesome. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, just kidding. Actually, you can stay there. <laughs> Sorry. Now, because these turtles do not nest here and are in the open ocean, our project uses boats, planes, high-tech equipment, as I just mentioned, and as well as a lot of patience. So during the late summer and early fall each year, we watch the weather and patiently wait for fogless days for the plane and the boat to get all eyes on the water and look for turtles. Now, when a leatherback is spotted, the plane calls to the boat, they dash to the location to get ready for capture, and the boat is guided by the aerial team and the capture of the turtle is carefully done using a hoop net, as you can see in that bottom photo. Once all of our data is collected and fitted with a, trans a satellite transmitter, the turtle is safely released back into the water. With hopes that the battery on the transmitter will last for months or even year, we will watch where they move on to next. So as you can tell, it takes a lot of time and effort to capture these turtles, but the amount of data that we can learn from each individual is huge. Uh, now the next slide, please. So some other important research tools we use to get use are through tissue collection. Now, by collecting a little piece of skin, fat, or blood from each turtle, we are able to use several different methods to get at some of these research questions. Now, we use genetic techniques where we extract DNA and basically look at their genetic makeup by sequencing the mitochondrial DNA, which I am not going into. But this allows us to identify the origin of individuals or which nesting populations they're coming from. Stable isotope analysis is a process where we look at elements such as carbon and nitrogen that are stored in the tissues as well as their potential prey items. And then based on the isotopic signatures, we can tell what these turtles are eating and where they are eating it. So whether it's closer to shore or far out in the open ocean. Uh, we can also assess their health by examining their tissues such as their fat content or their blood to see their nutrient levels or even contaminants they may be affected by. It's all very valuable information. Uh, next slide, please. Now looking at the spaghetti on the map, um, you can see examples of the transmitter tracks. Now our Central California turtle tracks are in green um, and you can see you can also see tracks from the leatherbacks that are tagged in the Western Pacific, seen in blue and red. The tracks overlap and they match up. So these leatherbacks literally cross the entire Pacific Ocean to go between where they eat and where they nest, which is also the longest known migration of any air-breathing aquatic marine vertebrate. Now we have learned from looking at the DNA of our turtles captured in Central California that their genetic fingerprints match the turtles that nest in the Western Pacific as the genetic signatures are very different than those found in the Eastern Pacific. So using genetics, we see the same pattern as the satellite tags. Now prior to these types of technologies, it was thought that the animals seen in California were from the Eastern Pacific, which is much closer in distance and would make sense, but it's clearly not the case. So we now know that the majority of Western Pacific leatherback migrate to and from the U.S. West Coast. Now, another important point to make after seeing where these turtles are traveling is the level of international collaboration it takes to protect these animals from the various threats they face along the way. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in addition to the satellite tags, we've also tagged leatherbacks with a video camera suction cup tag that we attach to its carapace. So as you can see in that top photo, this does not require us to capture the animal. And this little tag contains a video camera, a radio tag, so we can relocate the animal, and a time depth recorder. The tag eventually pops off in a matter of hours or days, 
and has provided us with amazing footage of dive behavior and what they eat. So the coastal waters off of California have seasonal masses of jellyfish, which support the calorie needs of a leatherback, making our waters an extreme, I mean, an important foraging destination. So these turtles eat this gelatinous prey, such as jellyfish and salps, and they must consume 25 to 68 percent of their body mass a day to maintain their weight and, and health. That can be up to 100 to 275 kilograms of jellyfish per day, depending on which items they're eating. Now, the picture on the bottom shows what the inside of a leatherback mouth looks like, which I think is super cool. Um, their throat and esophagus is made up of papillae, which allows them to hold down their food while they spit out the seawater. Uh, next slide, please. So we would like to show you a short video from one of our suction cup tags that we placed on the carapace of one of our California leatherbacks. Uh, the tag is right behind its head, so we are seeing what the leatherback is seeing. You can see the turtle searching for and gobbling down huge jellyfish. Pretty amazing technology. <laughs> so we hope you enjoy watching and learn something exciting about this important and amazing endangered species. Uh, we thank you all for attending and the best of luck in receiving your endangered species batch. So Aaron and Robin, can you answer a couple questions? So one, one of the questions right now is about how far out from land do sea turtles go? So from the from the PowerPoint we looked at um, a few slides ago, it looks like they go all the way across from North America to Japan, Australia. Yeah, the leatherbacks are traveling, so they nest on the beaches over in the green circle. So they're nesting over in the Western Pacific, and then they're swimming all the way across the Pacific Ocean to our waters in California. Now, where they don't come on land in California, but we are able to, we find them a couple miles offshore, and that's where they're eating jellyfish. So is there any cues that you see to make the sea turtles easier from seeing them from the air? And how far up are you traveling um, to be able to locate the turtles? Good, good question. So the plane we use is a tiny, um, there's a pilot and typically I sit next to the pilot. And on the sides, we have two observers and a belly observer. And on the sides of the plane, we have, we have these bubble windows. So we're able to look pretty much down below the plane and then we have somebody laying in the back of the plane that's laying on their bellies. Um, yeah, there's the Noah twin otter. Um, laying on their bellies looking through the bottom of the plane. So what we're doing is we're flying at 650 feet above the ocean. Um, amazingly, we can, see, we can see turtles, we can identify birds, we can see jellyfish, we see, we also at the same time do um, surveys of all the marine mammals and everything else that we see in the waters but it's pretty amazing what we can see at that, at that altitude. So can you go over why the sea turtle isn't getting stung by the sea nettles like we would? Yeah, you know, they actually, when they open up their mouths, when we have them on, boat, on the boat and they look in their mouths, it looks almost like they have little, they call them, well, our researchers say that they eat spicy food. <laughs> so they can see that they, you know, it affects them a tiny bit, but how they're able to withstand it, I'm not quite sure. The cool thing about these jellyfish is they go for all the gonads. So all of that ribbony stuff in the middle is where they're the, the highest calorie um, part of the jellyfish is. Now how they don't get stung like we do, I have no idea. I guess they're tough skin. I'm gonna do one more question. So do you see in the Arctic Ocean or any colder places? Robin, do you want to chime in? No, they do. They are found in waters as far up as Alaska, but they do not live in the Arctic or Antarctica. Well, I, I assume it's because they are technically cold-blooded 
and so they need to stay in the warmer temperate seas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and remember I said they have that fat, that fat layer, which allows them to go into colder waters, but they have kind of a preferred temperature, which is about uh, 17 degrees Celsius. I can't remember how that converts out. I think it's in the somewhere in the 60s for water temperature. Uh, I, we'll do one more. Do sea turtles ever switch beast, beaches to nest? That is a really good question. And they do switch beaches. So even though they have what's called, they exhibit what's called natal homing, which is where they typically will um, go back to nest on um, the same nest that they were born. Uh, there are instances, um, this is something that our satellite tracks show. So what Aaron was mentioning, mentioning how we can kind of track them similar to being able to move around with your cell phone and track, track yourself with a GPS. Um, the satellite tracks in areas um, like in the Caribbean where we have uh, St. Croix and Puerto Rico islands, which are very close to each other, we do have evidence of turtles nesting at either one of those beaches. Perfect. All right, girls, we are going to switch gears and keep up with the um, Endangered Species Patch Program. Um, we will come back to our leaders for step four. So thank you, Robin and Aaron, for such an insightful talk about leatherback sea turtles and how you are helping to protect these amazing species. Um, let's see. So step three is on your own. It's advocate with art. Um, make a creative project inspired by endangered species. The ideas are endless from an original artwork, a public service announcement, storybook, board game, infograph, just create to inspire. Um, check the booklet for more ideas to create on your own. And I'd like to share something with you. Um, the endangered species patch has meaning as every species is important as they circle around the planet. So I created and designed the artwork on this patch and drew the illustrations to share with you and highlight the Endangered Species Act. Did you know that all the illustrations on this patch are endangered species and are listed on page five of the booklet? All right, so what we all wanna get back to is our experience with our research scientists. So I would like to again introduce our NOAA researchers as we continue our virtual experience, learning about how their careers in STEM have helped these um, endangered leatherback sea turtles. Robin, I'm going to to you. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so Carrie asked us to provide a bit of background information for you on how we got to where we are today. So I'm a first generation college student, which means that neither of my parents went to college. As a teenager, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do for a career. So my next step out of high school was to go to junior college prior to transferring to a four year college. And at junior college, I had an amazing professor for my anatomy and physiology course. His passion for the environment was really contagious and it led me to pursue a career in environmental conservation. Because my parents didn't have the means to help me pay for college, I had to work part-time to full-time um, while I was earning both my undergraduate and my graduate degrees. Volunteering for a few of my professors while I was attending UC San Diego provided me with some key connections that eventually led to my position at the NOAA Fisheries Southwest Fishery Science Center, which is based in San Diego, California. Next slide. So right after I um, earned my undergraduate degree, I was hired as a lab technician for the newly formed Marine Turtle Genetics Group at the Southwest Fisheries. My main research focus, um, as Carrie mentioned before, was using genetic techniques to understand sea turtle populations and the impacts of threats um, to the various populations. As our turtle program continued to grow, I moved into a new position as the Marine Turtle Coordinator, where I assisted with the management and operations of our turtle programs, 
coordinated um, all of our strandings and continued with some research responsibilities. Honestly, it really didn't take me long to realize that I really liked the business side of running a research program and decided to pursue my master's um, in business administration instead of going the traditional route of getting my master's or PhD in biology. My broad experience in both uh, science and program management were instrumental in my selection as the deputy director of the Marine Mammal and Turtle Division several years ago. I would have to say that the best part of my job is having the opportunity to provide critical support for our incredible marine mammal and sea turtle science. And of course, I cannot forget to say that um, conducting field research really is um, true to my heart and one of the best parts of my job as well. Thanks. Next slide will be Erin. All right. Um, so I was a brownie at a young age, and I always loved the outdoors. Um, I didn't continue into Girl Scouts. I was very shy when I was a kid. But um, both my parents were, were both went to college and actually got graduate degrees, but they always encouraged me to go on um, and get a higher uh, education beyond high school. Um, so what I did was I spent a little bit of time traveling after high school. I didn't, just like Robin, I didn't know what I wanted to do yet, but I went to Fullerton Junior College um, and I was able to take a variety of classes, um, which I was hoping would kind of spark my interest in a career. Um, it was much, the college was much smaller than kind of the big universities. And because of that, I became very close with my professors. Um, I went on field trips, I went on camping trips, I even went to Costa Rica with my friend and zoology teacher, um, Chuck Lavelle. He was actually the one who truly inspired me to go into biology. Um, I loved all of the science classes that I took at Fullerton College, but it was uh, one semester I took an oceanography and an environmental studies class, and that kind of flipped the switch for me. Um, once I completed a lot of the basic courses for a biology degree, I transferred to UC San Diego and was there for a couple, I think three years before I graduated with my Bachelor of Science degree. Now, um, similarly, while I was at UCSD, I got involved in a lot of volunteer opportunities, which um, helped me gain valuable experience. Um, while I was there, I met a graduate student who needed help with her field work, measuring little tide pool fish. And it was ultimately that is what connected me to my job at Southwest Fisheries. Um, I also went on two Antarctic cruises by volunteering. So one of those things that I highly suggest if you've got the, the time or the passion, volunteer, because that's where you gain that experience. Um, next slide. Now I joined the Marine Turtle, well, it was the Marine Turtle Research Program um, back in 2000. So for 21 years, I've been focused on sea turtle research. And um, in the genetics lab, I, which is my main role, um, I work on all sea turtle species, uh, mainly hawksbills, greens, loggerheads, and leatherbacks. And the samples I work with come from nesting beaches, foraging grounds, um, fisheries bycatch, strandings, and even um, tortoiseshell products. So I primarily work with, I mentioned this before, but is mitochondrial DNA sequencing which basically allows us to better understand um, population structure and kind of the origin of say fisheries bycatch or strandings. Um, it's this type of data that then assists in the management and conservation of these populations. So uh, one of the cool projects I recently worked on is um, I published a manuscript um, that was with confiscated turtle products so unfortunately, in a lot of places in Asia Pacific and elsewhere around the world, they harvest hawksbills. Um, they use their shell to make jewelry, bracelets and earrings and stuff like that. So I successfully extracted DNA from some of those products and was able to kind of trace back which nesting beaches they came from, like the origin of those turtles. Um, and then we can basically from there find out which populations are most affected by that illegal trade. 
Um, as same with Robin, my the the field work is by is my favorite part of my job. Um, working with hands on with turtles is amazing, and I'm very fortunate to do it. Um, my field work ranges. I fly the aerial surveys in Central California. Uh, we're lucky to go to St. Croix in the Virgin Islands where we walk the nesting beaches and help monitor leatherbacks. Um, locally in our own waters, we're fortunate to have a foraging uh, population of green sea turtles. So I drive boats and help set nets and we catch turtles to do all sorts of research here. But it is truly the best part of my job. I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, after Robin took a new role, I then started to coordinate the sea turtle strandings, which as sad as it is dealing with stranded turtles, the information we learn from those events are extremely valuable as well. Um, and then another aspect that I actually enjoy is, uh, it was mentioned before, is I coordinate our CITES permits. Um, and where we basically, so because all turtles are endangered, they, in order to send samples or anything of that nature across international lines, you have to have particular permits. So I get to work with a lot of people around the world dealing with those permits. Um, and yeah, I, very, I love my job. I'm honored to work with and help um, these endangered species. So thank you again for having us. We are so happy that you're here. I have two questions. So um, one of our questions is, um, do turtles swim in pods or congregate? So they're Not, solitary individuals swimming around. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. They don't swim in pods, per se. Um, they do kind of congregate, I guess you could say, um, off the nesting beaches. So the females during particular times of year, um, when they're in their nesting cycle, will go to the nesting beaches. And oftentimes the males mating will occur off those beaches and then they'll make their way back to the foraging grounds. So they'll kind of hang out together, but they don't swim in pods. I was just making that clear. Um, so mm -hmm. this one's a little, this one's, this one's more about tag recapture. So our girl says, um, so both Robin and Erin, you both worked in different countries or in different islands studying sea turtles. Have you ever encountered one turtle at two different places? Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, so we um, answered that, I guess, a little bit before in terms of the nesting uh, population and whether the animals nest in two different areas. Uh, we have um, ha interacted, so we have tagged leatherbacks on beaches in Indonesia um, where we put like a, a, an identifying tag on them. And we have seen those animals in the foraging areas off of uh, Central California. So if you remember that map that Erin showed you from the nesting beaches to where they come to eat off of California, we have seen animals um, from one place into the next place and vice versa. All right, girls, we are gonna move back to the um, Endangered Species Patch Program so step five, all right, teams, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, you got to listen to us being passionate about endangered species and their environment. This step is up to you. Check out the booklet for more great ideas, but it is your turn to be passionate about endangered species and help them out. So help out a new group of girls appreciate endangered species or leatherback sea turtles and our environment. Um, this opportunity is to take everything you've learned and enjoyed and put it into action. Don't forget to complete the patch program to earn your endangered species patch. Now, we realize that right now we're not really able to get together in person, but you could certainly use this time as an opportunity to plan what you want to do with your newfound passion of leatherback sea turtles or endangered species with others. All right, you could celebrate endangered species with younger Girl Scouts. Consider reaching out to your service unit manager 
and getting involved with younger troops. You could even put together some virtual resources for younger girls to learn about endangered species and pairing it with a virtual troop meeting. You could consider writing an article or creating informational video to share. All right, so I'm gonna post, let's see, one more poll, let's see. And I hope that you are now more likely to take action to address wildlife conservation issues in your community or in the world. So again, here's your opportunity to take everything you learned and enjoyed and use it to help others appreciate endangered species. Um, by the way, um, the picture here is a white abalone, which we will get to in a second because it is one of the Noah's species in the spotlight. And it is one of the most endangered species in the United States that NOAA protects. All right, thank you girls for participating in our poll. Okay. At NOAA, the leatherback sea turtle is on the species list that was developed for species so critically endangered that they are at a high risk of extinction. We call them species in the spotlight. Immediate action must be taken to save these nine species or they will go extinct on our watch. The five recovery actions for leatherback sea turtles are reduce fishery interactions, enhance nesting beach protection and reproductive output, international cooperation, monitor and research, and definitely public engagement which is what we're doing right now. At the end of the next section, we can talk about many ways you can help to conserve these species because we are the solution. Think about how you can make a difference. Um, so think globally, act locally. We ask ourselves, what does this really mean? And I wanna give you a big example. So we're cutting balloons. People release these locally but they are a global problem. Where do they end up? Everywhere and anywhere. There are so many individual actions that you can take. Every one of us can play a part in saving these magnificent creatures. An important thing we call, we call can do is reduce trash that goes into the ocean that could entangle or be accidentally eaten by sea turtles. You can do this by joining in local beach cleanups reusing reusable bags instead of plastic bags and never, ever releasing balloons. They will likely end up in the ocean where sea turtles can mistake them for prey and even eat them. Be sure to tell your friends to suggest that bubbles are a nice way to celebrate instead of balloons. You know now that sea turtle shells and other parts are sometimes made into jewelry or souvenirs. When you're traveling if you don't buy those things, you will be helping us protect sea turtles. If you see a sick or injured sea turtle, contact your local stranding network. You can find a complete list on the NOAA website. Remember things you bring to the beach like chairs and umbrellas. Fill in holes and knock down sandcastles before you leave the beach. To tiny sea turtle hatchlings, your moat it is an enormous mountain that they have to climb. If you're fishing, watch for sea turtles in the water. Stay at least 50 yards away. If you see them um, closer, put your engine in neutral to avoid hitting them. Watch for schools of small fish or jellyfish, since that means the turtles could be nearby. And wear polarized sunglasses to help you see um, the animals better in the water. Use a barbless circle hook to make it easier for sea turtles to avoid injury. And of course, choose seafood caught in ways that do not harm or kill sea turtles. You can find out which fisheries are best from different places. Um, the one place that manages this is called Fish Watch. There are more things you can do and you can find out more on NOAA's website. We, they even have a story up on what you can do to save sea turtles. I hope you will all join me in helping save the Pacific leatherback sea turtle. All right. Um, so, see what time? Oh, 
Um, you can also share an issue that matters to you with your community. Call, write your state or federal senator, representatives, or congressman in office and explain why you care about your important topic. We encourage um, letter writing to local businesses to encourage them to implement environmentally friendly policies, not giving out straws or plastic utensils, not using styrofoam takeout containers, not using plastic bags, et cetera. State regulators are also important. Girls, you can write letters to your town council or state legislators to encourage bans on plastic bags within their with your local area. So I pledge, whoops, um, again, we are Girl Scouts, we are the solution. We know how to make a change and take action. So I pledge, um, I will share my pledge. I refuse to use, um, I've been doing this for a while. I'll just say, I have my own little straw. I have my Nalgene bottle. I take my water bottle everywhere. I refuse to use single use plastic items because we are the solution. So eco advocates, make sure you, um, eco advocates, make sure you inspire. So what's next? I know that there's a lot of girls asking, how did I complete this patch? Did I complete this patch? So let's recap. Um, definitely check out the booklet because we cannot complete a patch or a badge in an hour virtually. Um, so what did we do? Um, we um, completed the leatherback sea turtle investigation. So we did half of part two and we did all of step four. So I hope you've enjoyed our partnership with NOAA and this great virtual endangered species webinar about Pacific leatherback sea turtles while enlightening you to complete the patch. I wanna thank again, Noah, for sharing their career and enlightening us on how to take action. Maybe becoming a research scientist like Robin or Aaron is in your future and protecting our environment. So I always say this, make every day endangered species day. And let's see. If you guys could complete our survey, I do have one more Zoom poll because you know, your opinion matters. And for us to continue doing these webinars, we need your opinion. So if you could, I don't know, take our survey, we'd appreciate it. Um, so girls, we have two amazing research scientists um, on our webinar. Do you girls have any questions? about careers or anything that you would like to ask them. I am looking. I guess I guess the biggest one that that's keep coming up is um so Robin or Aaron, what is your favorite sea turtle? Can you even choose? Oh you guys are both on mute. Personally mine is the leatherback. <laughs> I would say um, both the leatherback and green, and probably because I've had uh, most of my field experience has involved um, research with both of those species. So I really love just interacting and being around them and learning learning about them. And the, the really great thing about doing science is that you can even 20 years later, we're still answering new questions. And that's just something that continues to fascinate me, um, the science side of me as I uh, continue in my career. So it's been really fun seeing all how all of the technology has evolved and how we've been able to use it in our research. And then um, I really look forward to seeing what's on the horizon because our, our technology, as we all know, is evolving so quickly and we're, there are so many more uh, questions out there to answer. And I think we're just at a really neat time um, in our history to be able to do that. Do we know the population size of the Pacific leatherback sea turtle? I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, the Western Pacific is doing a little better than the Eastern Pacific, but they're both critically endangered. I think they're both under a thousand. I'm looking at the graph, Erin. 
<laughs> and so both under a thousand for the Eastern Pacific and the Western Pacific. And the Eastern Pacific population, which is the populations in Mexico and Central America, are doing even worse than the Western Pacific populations, which are not doing good either. So leatherbacks in the Pacific are critically, uh, critically endangered. What temperature um, during the NASC produce females and males? Yeah, that's a great okay. question. Oh. Do, yeah. do you want, I, I saw the question, so I looked up the exact temperature. Oh, so, um, below 81.6 degrees Fahrenheit uh, will produce males, and then above 87, about 87.8 87 produces females, and then in between, kind of depending on what the temperature, uh, where the egg is in the nest chamber, that'll determine if it's male or female. And as I was mentioning about technology, they now have these little tiny things that kind of look like um, like an aspirin or something almost. I mean, it's not much bigger than that, that we can drop into the nest when the sea turtle's laying the egg. And then that monitors the nest temperature over the course of the 60 days of the incubation period. And once the nest hatches, we can go back and pull that out and actually determine if that nest, um, you know, all the hatchlings that survive, if they're going to be able to be males or females. So I guess the question would be, in light of climate change, change and the weather increasing, are you finding that the, the nest on the beach are producing more of one sex than the other? Is this gonna be a problem? Yeah, it's definitely, um, you know, we think it's going to be an issue moving forward. And some of our colleagues recently published a paper um, on green turtles in Australia on this particular subject. So where a lot of that population is um, coming out as female now because the nest temperatures are, are warmer. Interesting. Um, so Robin and Aaron, what is the hardest part of being a sea turtle researcher? And we have, we have one of our girls who says that they wanna be a marine biologist when they grow up. Go ahead, Erin, I'll let you take that one. Sorry, I missed the second half of the question. I was, I had to sneeze. <laughs> um, so Sorry. what is the hardest part of being a sea turtle researcher? And um, she says, Rob, another Robin says that she wants to be a marine biologist when she grows up. So as far as being the marine biologist, as both Robin and I did when we were in college, is volunteer. Volunteer as much as you possibly can, um, because that's where you gain not only the experience, but also um, communication and relationships with people, um, where you kind of learn where those jobs are. Um, the hardest part about being a, a sea turtle biologist is probably, well, I don't deal with this all as much, but funding. Funding is always an issue. <laughs> I'm sure with more money, we could do more research, but maybe Robin has more insight. Yeah, I would say probably one of the hardest things that, one of the things that I find the most difficult is um, having patience. So sometimes when we're in the field, you know, you go out there, you're really excited. It takes a lot of effort and investment to get ourselves ready to be out in the field. And then you go out and you don't, see any turtles or catch anything um but we just have to remain positive and think like negative data points are also really good good data points so you have to look at it take the glass half full uh, approach to that but just making sure that we have patience and understanding that you know the turtles they're in their natural environment and we're kind of there just trying to do our research, but they're not going to march to our tune, I guess. There are a lot of questions, so I'm just fielding through to see. Girls, we still have, we still have a little time for questions, and I'm looking through to see, um, I don't know, I guess one would be, 
Um, when turtles get near each other, do they actually communicate with each other? Do we know like dolphins and whales? Um, do turtles do anything? Not necessarily. They're not a very social species like dolphins or whales. I mean, they communicate with each other when they're mating, but I would say that would probably be the only time. As Erin said, like there are populations where there are more than one turtle. So we, like in San Diego, we have about 60 or so turtles that, that live in San Diego Bay as their foraging area, but they're not necessarily interacting with each other's like a dolphin uh, would. Um, on the in California, do you guys deal with any kind of cold stunned sea turtles, and how do you deal with them? Um, on the East Coast, we hear a lot of um, turtles all of a sudden end up in Massachusetts, and the Boston Aquarium is rehabbing them, and then they're released back in the Maryland waters. Um, do you guys deal with stranding cold strandings? We do little bits, nothing like the East Coast. The East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico gets hit really hard by those cold snaps. And what happens with cold stun events is, is when the water temperature drops quickly. Um, in the Pacific, we see um, olive ridleys are the ones that we see most affected by it. Um, we don't see large numbers of olive ridleys, but oftentimes we will get live strandings um, in Central California, they get them up in Oregon and Washington where the waters are definitely too cold. Um, so they're kind of cold stun events, but nothing like what, what the East Coast sees. Yeah, interesting. Um, girls, I see a lot of um, questions about how you can volunteer. Um, definitely the one idea is to search volunteers, sea turtles. Um, I do know that NOAA in Silver Springs has some volunteer opportunities, but I think you need to be of college age. Um, but definitely check out um, the um, National Aquarium in Baltimore, um, other resources, there might be something out there. I don't have anything offhand um, that I know of immediately that you guys can um, look up. But again, um, and I see other questions, Girls, the whole idea is to get you interested in the Endangered Species Patch Program. A lot of these questions that you're asking, you need to actually do the research and find the answer to do step one. Um, so let's see. I'm, I'm looking at the questions and I think, let's see. Um, I think we're about done. I think we've answered everything. I want to, again, um, thank both Robin and Aaron, and um, you don't see them, but um, Rachel and Katie are behind scenes helping out with um, the chat and just getting this organized. So thank you guys very much for participating. And this is our second annual Sea Turtle Week virtual program with Noah. So everyone have a wonderful Girl Scout day. Thank you.